taking a look today, we've got uh, uh, our information on training the aerobic and the anaerobic energy systems. Uh, one of the biggest things we're going to be looking at today is like work to rest ratios. That's going to be really fun uh, because that has a huge effect physiologically on how your body can adapt and how your body can respond and stuff. Um, so our objectives today, we want to understand the principles of exercise training. So we are going to be looking a lot at principles today. Um, you know, these are just basically general guidelines, you know, like I said, there's other certifications out there, you know, ACSM, NSSA, or yeah, NEST, NESTA, <laughs> ISSA is the one I was going to uh, ACE, you know, there's a ton of other like personal training certifications. Um, and basically all of them have kind of drew, drew, drawn their own conclusions that are all for the most part, really similar. Like, honestly, there's not a huge difference. It's not like you're going to walk into a gym and, you know, be talking with your coworker someday, uh, who's like an ACE trainer. And they're going to say, oh, no, that's not how your body builds muscle. Your body builds muscle uh, when it, you know, drops to a certain temperature. And it's like, what? It's like, I read it in my book. And it's like, well, your book, you know, like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> um, for the most part, like everybody has the same information, but the way they organize it is a little bit different. Um, so we're not really talking about NASM's organization tools today. What we're talking about in general are just the principles of strength, right? Uh, the principles of neurologic adaptation um, and everything like that. So we're going to talk about like the principle of overload, uh, specificity is probably the most important one in my opinion, individual differences and reversibility. Those are, those are kind of like no brainers. Um, we'll talk about like uh, uh, the role of ATP transfer and how it actually works. You know, obviously all of these principles came from somewhere and they came from our understanding of, uh, of ATP usage um, and other things. Uh, and then we'll also talk about some of the training adaptations that take place when you do aerobic and anaerobic um, training. We'll talk a little bit about like fast twitch fibers as they relate to sprinting. So again, like I said, uh, today isn't necessarily meant to be like a day about cardio, um, but that doesn't, I mean, it, obviously we're going to talk about cardio, but uh, that does not mean that we're not going to talk about sprinting today. Um, sprinting and cardio are not really the same thing in my head, at least. Uh, like when I think of cardio, I generally think of like long duration uh, exercise, right? But sprinting is very much like short duration exercise. Um, and so we'll talk about like how there's, there's a substantial difference between those two things. Um, the adaptations that take place with aerobic training and how it affects your things like stroke volume and cardiac output. Uh, we'll talk about how it affects your VO2 max the role and influence of anaerobic training can have on VO2 max as well. And then we will sort of wrap everything up with a big talk on interval training. So we've got a lot of learning objectives today because we're covering a lot of different ground. You can see the notes are fairly large, but they will move a little bit quicker than they have in the last couple of days. Here we go. Love this lesson. Uh, so when it comes to the principles of exercise training, right? Uh, when it comes to improving, you know, overall athletic performance, making a healthier individual, helping somebody meet their goals, uh, or, you know, even just like helping somebody fit into an outfit that they're trying to get into, you know, um, it's January guys, it's new year's resolution time, you know, like gyms are absolutely going to be exploding with people right now. Um, so in order to improve athletic performance, there's a couple of uh, universally accepted principles that, uh, that really are, are going to help us here, right? And so when it comes to like universally accepted principles, these are sort of like general guidelines that are going to kind of help us. And as long as we keep our understanding of those things in the back of our brains, when we are, you know, going somewhere, um, you know, it's going to help us uh, write more effective programs. Like for instance, you know, to use like kind of an analogy, I just got back from Oregon over Christmas, right? Like my girlfriend and I, like I was up in there and then my girlfriend was in, and then she flew over and then we drove, we both drove back down together. Now I didn't, you know, as long as I generally head south from Oregon, you know, like I'm going to end up back in California, you know? Um, obviously the state's pretty wide, but in general, I knew like at any time, like, even if I was in a city or a section, I didn't know where I was. I was like, if I just go South for the most part, like I'm going to be traveling in generally the right direction. Cause we were taking all these like weird little pit stops and going off like these little weird, weird roads and stuff, you know, but 
obviously, and that's good. And it would totally get me home eventually. I'd be like, all right, I know I'm south. And I also know I'm pretty close to the ocean, you know, <laughs> like uh, as long as I hug the coast and stay south, I'll, I'll be pretty good, you know, but effective training programs, like truly, truly, truly effective programs are going to be much, much more specific than that. And so plugging, you know, the directions into my GPS, which is like, hey, you can get to the 101 a little bit faster if you take this street and that street and this street, you know, while I'm in some town, that's going to be a much more specific, much more efficient and much more effective route to get me home quickly, right? Well, the same thing is true of training, right? If you go to the gym consistently, like Monday through Friday, you know, put the effort in and work pretty, you know, work relatively hard and, and do this and do that, like you're going to end up getting pretty decent results. Not, not bad, you know, but often what happens is people hit like a really hard plateau. They hit some type of plateau, they get stuck um, and then they don't make any more progress and they get frustrated and then they, they get, oftentimes people give up and that's not great, you know, which is why, you know, oftentimes it's like, you know, a lot of times we use the phrase, it's like, oh, you're getting the best of both worlds, you know, I would argue if you are doing very general training, a lot of times you're getting the worst of both worlds, you know, you're getting, uh, you're sort of taking some of the, you're, you're getting some of the strengths of this and some of the strengths of that, but unfortunately, you're also getting a lot of the weaknesses. Um, so uh, effective training definitely is going to be much more specific. Um, and your cardiovascular system, you know, is where we're looking at very, you know, specific types of like training as well, because like, obviously there's a lot of differences between, you know, like a marathon runner, a football player, a basketball player, soccer player, right? All of those people are definitely going to rely a little bit on cardiovascular uh, work, but they're all very, very, very different sports, right? Um, so regular exercise obviously has very big benefits, uh, when it comes to obesity due to calorie burn, diabetes due to glycogen, you know, if we are working really intensely, we know we can burn through our glycogen stores. So our body can utilize sugar more effectively, which is great. If you have diabetes, uh, it can affect your blood pressure. Think about like when you're doing cardio, right? You're consistently sending blood from one spot to another. Uh, and that can have a really positive effect on like strengthening your heart and like, you know, getting your blood vessels to learn how to contract and relax and contract and relax. Like we want to do little blood vessel reps, you know, uh, and it can have a really positive benefit on our cholesterol, particularly men are going to get a big, I mean, this has a, for the record, exercise has a positive benefit for all of us, but guys, we have a really positive benefit to lowering cholesterol, uh, which is helpful considering that men have way worse cholesterol in general than, than most women do statistically, at least. Um, but one of the things is like exercise will help you convert your cholesterol into testosterone, which then will have muscle building benefits. So that's great. You know, we're getting a lot of like really cool, you know, benefits from exercise here. So first thing we're going to look at, I know I don't need to sell you guys on exercise, <laughs> but hopefully like, you know, the more you hear this stuff, it'll, it'll be easier to translate to your clients when you got to make a sale, you know, because <laughs> that is sort of part of our industry as well. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is what's called the principle of overload. Okay. So the principle of overload is one of our, our main guiding training principles, right? Uh, a lot of people would argue this is probably the most important one. Now I like the principle of specificity. That's my favorite one personally, but you will often hear trainers and videos and stuff talk about the principle of overload. A lot of times other people, they call it progressive overload. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video here uh, as, of, a, of a couple different examples of progressive overload. Um, it's not the right video here. Is this the one? No, it's. Is this the one I like? I mean, I watch this one. Increase the frequency of your workouts. Oh yeah, this guy's got kind of a. <laughs> yeah, he's got a he's got an accent, but uh, this is a good one because it's only in like two and a half minutes <laughs> compared to this one, which I've watched is very good, but it's also kind of. Well, you know what? Let's try this one because <laughs> this is a really good video. Uh, Flow high performance, by the way. Um, very small YouTube channel, but like every time they put stuff out, I, I really like it. 
Hey everyone, Petey here from. All right. Uh, also has an exit. By the way. <laughs> today, like today and tomorrow, we're gonna be watching videos of Australians explaining physiology. <laughs> There's a lot of really good work that comes out of out of Australia, actually. So um, here's a little video that's gonna kind of explain uh, uh, training when it comes to progressive overload, training for strength versus training for hypertrophy. Both of these things are very, very good, um, but there is a little bit of a difference between the two. So here we go. Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance. And in this video, we will cover how the principle of progressive overload differs between strength and hypertrophy training. First, let's establish what exactly the principle of progressive overload is. Progressive overload essentially refers to making training harder over time. The training stimulus must disrupt homeostasis to some extent to cause an adaptation of some form. However, as the system adapts to greater stress levels, the stimulus required to disrupt homeostasis becomes greater. If we always provide the exact same stimulus, then we simply won't continue to adapt and improve. Instead, we will maintain the same level of adaptation. So in terms of resistance training, this basically means that we need to train harder over time in order to continue making strength and hypertrophy gains. But what does training harder actually mean? How much harder should we train? What variables do we need to manipulate? And how does this differ between strength and hypertrophy? These are the details we will try to answer throughout the rest of this video. To understand this, we first need to explore what exactly strength and hypertrophy adaptations are. Let's now explore each of these adaptations in more detail. First, let's take a look at muscle hypertrophy. Hypertrophy simply refers to an increase in muscle size. This is primarily achieved through a phenomenon we call myofibrillar hypertrophy. This is when we see an increase in the number of myofibrils, which are the smallest form of contractile tissue in the muscle. As we increase the number of myofibrils, each muscle fiber becomes larger in diameter, which ultimately leads to a bigger muscle belly. This results in a thicker overall muscle, which is the ultimate goal of hypertrophy style training. There are also other adaptations which have been proposed to contribute to muscle growth. These are sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and hyperplasia, but we don't fully understand how prevalent they are in human muscle and to what extent they contribute to muscle growth. So for this- We'll be talking more about that tomorrow. In this video, we aren't going to worry about these. Hypertrophy will just refer to myofibrillar hypertrophy. So what this means is that hypertrophy is a structural or morphological adaptation. This means the goal for hypertrophy training is to change the structure of the muscle tissue. In other words, grow bigger muscles. So it is not a performance outcome, meaning the goal isn't to lift the most weight possible. This will have relevance to the concept of progressive overload when we cover it later in this video. Strength, on the other hand, is a different adaptation. Strength refers to maximizing how much load we can lift usually for a one rep max. We don't care how big the muscle is or how our physique looks, the goal is to simply lift the most amount of weight possible. There are many factors which play a role in maximal strength, although there are two main adaptations which contribute to strength. These are hypertrophy and neural adaptations. Hypertrophy, like we have discussed, refers to an increase in muscle size. Increasing the size of the prime movers of a lift can contribute to strength gains by providing more total muscle mass to produce force. A bigger muscle means that there is more total contractile tissue to contribute to muscle contraction and force production. Neural adaptations, on the other hand, refers to how much force can be produced with the given muscle mass we have. We can learn to produce more force without changing how much muscle mass we have. This is due to several neural adaptations, including improved rate coding, increased motor unit recruitment, greater coordination, and more efficient lifting technique. Neural adaptations are specific to the task we train. This means we must practice the specific lifts we want to get stronger at with heavy loads to maximize neural efficiency. So now we have explored what exactly strength and hypertrophy adaptations are. Next, let's discuss how training for each adaptation compares and contrasts. Although strength and hypertrophy are highly compatible adaptations and have significant overlap in how they are trained, specific training variables may be manipulated in different ways to maximize the response of each. Let's now cover what variables may differ and how they may be adjusted to suit each training goal. The first is exercise selection. 
For hypertrophy training, there are no mandatory exercises we must perform. We can achieve equal muscle growth outcomes using a range of different exercises for the same muscle group. This is because exercise selection is simply a means to stress the target muscle. However, for strength training, exercise selection is more important. This is because like we mentioned, neural efficiency follows the principle of specificity. This means that we need to train the exercises we want to become stronger at to maximize neural adaptations. This means that when we want to be at our peak strength, we need to train those specific lifts. The next variable is rep ranges and load. Hypertrophy can be equally achieved across a large spectrum of different rep ranges and loads, provided that sets are taken close to failure. We can train anywhere in the approximate 6 to 25 rep range and achieve equivalent muscle growth on a per set basis. Strength training, on the other hand, is more straightforward. Once again, because neural adaptations abide by the principle of specificity, the rep ranges and loads used have a more direct impact. Essentially, we need to lift heavy to maximize strength gains. So training in the one to five rep range is probably ideal to maximize neural efficiency. So when lifters need to be in peak condition for strength, it is important to train with heavy loads and lower rep ranges. Next, we have volume. Volume in this context refers to the total number of sets performed per muscle group or per lift each week. Volume appears to be an important variable for hypertrophy training. From the current evidence we have, this seems to follow a dose-response relationship, where more volume results in a faster rate of muscle growth. Provided that we are training with a sufficient proximity to failure, volume appears to be the most influential variable for hypertrophy outcomes. For strength training, this is not necessarily the same case. For long-term strength gains, we do need to achieve significant muscle growth, so volume will be an important factor. However, for neural efficiency, volume is far less important than intensity. This means the number of sets we perform for a lift throughout the week doesn't seem to have much of an impact on short-term neural adaptations. It is far more important to ensure we train the specific lifts with heavy loads than the number of sets we perform per week. However, it should be noted that we still need to train with sufficient volume to grow muscle, which will be a long-term contributor to strength. And the last variable we will cover is interset rest. For hypertrophy training, it seems that interset rest doesn't have a significant impact on muscle growth. There does seem to be a slight benefit for longer interset rest periods, but these benefits are not all that substantial. A general rule would be to rest around 1 to 3 minutes between sets for hypertrophy training. For strength training, rest periods are more important. This is because interset rest will influence acute fatigue and therefore the load lifted. As we have established, it is important to lift heavy for neural strength adaptations, so longer rest periods will be superior to maximize neural efficiency. Essentially, when training to maximize neural efficiency, we want to allow full recovery between sets which would normally take around three to six minutes for most free weight compound lifts. So now that we have explored how training for strength and hypertrophy may differ slightly, we can now discuss the concept of progressive overload. While progressive overload is an important consideration for both training goals, their implementation into a program should probably be slightly different. Ads. <laughs> So you see what he's saying so far, just as a, I'm going to take a little, little inner, inner section in here. <laughs> um, so he's talking about a lot about how like there is sort of a substantial difference. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice that some of the numbers might be off from the ones you're familiar with. And Alexia and Simon, I know you guys actually aren't super familiar with our numbers just yet. That's what I'm going to teach you at the end of the module. But like David Joseph and, and Chris, you guys might have noticed, you're like, uh, that guy just said hypertrophy is like six to 25 reps. See, NASM takes the stance that it's anywhere from six to 20, but really for the maximal muscle growth, NASM's a big fan of six to 12. 12 to 20 is much more reserved. It will result in muscle growth. Like I say this all the time, like the stabilization level, uh, whoops, does not get enough credit for being as good at muscle growth as it actually is. It's, it's much better for muscle growth than it than we think of when we hear stabilization. We often hear stabilization, we think cardio. And hey, guess what? That's correct and, and it is good. But like there is still some muscle growth that does happen there, right? Um, it's just how we progress, it's very, very different. So 
you know, and then the one to five strength range, that's pretty much the same uh, for everybody. And then, you know, one thing he's not talking about here is like cardiovascular adaptations, you know, well, we would just extrapolate this even further. You'll notice that like our intensity was really high for strength. It was medium for hypertrophy. Well, <laughs> if we're going for cardio, our intensity would be low <coughs> because we're trying to, you know, uh, go over like a long duration, right? And then like, we talked about how like the rest period for hypertrophy is like one to three minutes. The rest period for strength is like, some people will say three to five, sometimes it goes even higher. I've, I've seen a very old school workout that is like literally like eight minutes of rest. Um, and then uh, when it comes to cardio, you wanna keep your rest as short as possible because that's gonna force cardiovascular adaptations. So uh, I think he's about to get into, yeah. Okay, so here's the actual, progressive overload part. This is the, the real part that I want you guys to pay attention to. Oh, I'm it's training goal. It's on mute. Good job, me. All right, here we go. With training goals, the training for strength and hypertrophy may differ slightly. We can now discuss the concept of progressive overload. While progressive overload is an important consideration for both training goals, their implementation into a program should probably be slightly different. Let's now cover how they can be applied to each training goal and how they may differ. The ultimate goal for strength training is to lift more weight. So for progressive overload, the intent should be to lift more weight over time. If we aren't lifting heavier loads over time, we aren't getting stronger. This doesn't mean we need to increase load lifted every single week. It just means that over time, we should be consistently aiming to increase load on the bar. This will be a result of several different adaptations, including muscle growth, neural efficiency, and technique improvements. But ultimately, these all help us to lift more weight for more repetitions over time. For example, let's say a trainee wants to get stronger at the back squat. Over a 12-week period, a training program may look something like this. As we can see here, the lifter intentionally increases the load lifted and works in lower rep ranges across the 12 weeks. Furthermore, the lifter trains with a higher volume, as calculated by number of sets, in the earlier stages of the cycle, and drops volume at the expense of intensity towards the end of the cycle. This will emphasize hypertrophy adaptations earlier in the cycle, and maximize neural efficiency later in the cycle to peak. The key factor to note here is that the trainee is intentionally trying to manipulate variables to lift more weight over time. Progressive overload for hypertrophy, on the other hand, is slightly more difficult to understand. Remember, hypertrophy is a structural adaptation, not a performance outcome. So the ultimate goal of hypertrophy training is not to lift heavier loads over time, it is to maximally stress the muscle. Muscle stress is what will cause hypertrophy adaptations, not necessarily the external load that we lift. However, as a muscle grows in size, it also naturally becomes stronger and allows heavier loads to be lifted. So as a result, we should see improvements in reps performed and load lifted over time. This is where it gets somewhat confusing. Essentially, performance improvements should be a result of muscle growth, not a driver of muscle growth. So we shouldn't be chasing strength gains. Strength gains should occur as a result of hypertrophy over time. This means we shouldn't change technique or lift in lower rep ranges for the sake of maximizing how much load we can lift. We should focus on maximizing stress on the target muscle. Then if we see performance improvements over time with the same strict and effective technique, that is probably a good indicator that you have grown muscle in the prime movers. For example, let's use the same lifter to demonstrate how progressive overload can be implemented for the goal of hypertrophy. First, we can see here that we have a leg press rather than a squat because the specific exercise we implement isn't as important. We can also see here that the number of sets performed is greater and remains the same for the entire 12 week cycle. The load is relatively lighter and also doesn't change across the entire cycle either. And most importantly, the proximity to failure is prescribed to ensure each set is sufficiently hypertrophic regardless of the load or rep ranges used. So as the lifter goes through the program, they should naturally see slight improvements in lifting performance over time as a result of hypertrophy adaptations. For example, over an eight week period, the average number of reps performed fluctuates, but shows a general positive trend over time. So rather than prescribing progressive overload, 
progressive overload naturally occurs as a result of effective hypertrophy training. <coughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, so that is um, sort of a detailed breakdown on like overload, right? So I got a couple different examples of progressive overload here. And basically like, well, actually let's start with the definition. So <clears throat> the principle of overload, which is progressive overload, right? States, it, it's a principle that states that greater than normal stress is required for any training adaptation to take place. The way I like to summarize this when I'm explaining it to my clients is I always say, if your body has no reason to adapt, then it won't adapt, right? Like I used to teach these, you know, these really high intensity, like, you know, or well, I'm actually really high energy, low intensity, uh, cardiovascular classes. They were basically like spin classes, uh, but you could be on any piece of equipment you wanted. And I'd be on a microphone. I'd just be bouncing around the room, telling people when to sprint and when to recover. And I would always tell people, I'm like, look, I need you to push yourself right now. I want you to dig deep. We're going to go hard because I want your body to go, oh no, I sucked at that, you know, <laughs> and that will cause your body then to adapt. <laughs> Um, so we need to do something that we're not good at so that our body will, it will trigger growth in order to get good at it. Because if your body has no reason to adapt, then it won't, right? So we got a couple different uh, examples here. You can see uh, physiologic responses to overload. Some of it is like hypertrophy, right? Your body will experience growth in response to tissue overload. And for the record, this does go backwards as well. There is the opposite of hypertrophy, which is called atrophy, A for opposite, right? Hyper for lots of. So uh, this is lots of growth. This is opposite growth. So atrophy is where a muscle will experience a tissue breakdown um, if it exceeds tissue buildup. So if you don't give your body any reason to adapt, you don't, you know, <laughs> if you don't use it, you lose it, you know? <laughs> Um, not to quote Steve Carell or anything, but, <laughs> uh, but that's sort of how, how that works, right? So once your muscles have adapted, then a new stress is going to be required in order for you to continue getting stronger, which is why your intensity might stay the same per week, or maybe you actually increase it, right? Maybe you keep the intensity the same, but you do more sets. Maybe you do more reps, right? Or maybe you do less sets, less reps, and you raise the intensity. It just depends on what adaptation you're going for and how you're trying to overload. If we've got a client who's going for hypertrophy, we're just trying to do more work, more sets, more reps, right? If the weight goes up, great, but it's not really a priority. With strength gains, the priority is strength. So we are literally just paying attention to how much weight goes on the bar, right? Um, that's our big deal. When it comes to cardio, right? Or what are you trying to do? Are you trying to uh, increase your, or, uh, <laughs> increase, trying to decrease your resting heart rate? Well, awesome. Then our goal is to do long, consistent cardiovascular training. Is your goal to get faster? Okay, great. Then we need to do short bursts of in high intensity training. Just depends on what it, how we're trying to overload, right? We'll see some nervous system changes here as well when it comes to the principle of overload. Uh, you know, nervous system changes such as an increase in your motor units. Um, so we haven't talked too much about motor units. We, we mentioned it briefly the other day, but we look at a motor unit. This is what it is, right? Uh, it's where you've got one neuron and that neuron will come down. Here's the, the tail end of it, right? Here's a neuron. And then that tail end splits off into, let's see, one, two, three, four, five fingers in this case, right? For the record, five is actually very small. Um, you've got very big motor units, you've got very small motor units. But the way this works is this neuron will zap all of those muscle fibers right there simultaneously, and they'll all contract. I'll pull up here, you can see it again. Here's a motor unit sort of in action, right? Um, so the stimulus travels down the neuron, zap, 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 and they all contract simultaneously. That's a motor unit. So strength is very determined. When I say strength, I mean how much weight you can lift, is very determined by uh, how many motor units you can recruit. So like a single motor neuron and all the my muscle fibers it innervates can really zap like a lot more muscle, especially if you make more motor units, right? So like 
when you guys are contracting your eyeballs <laughs> and you're like moving them around and you know doing all this like look over there look over there right you're squeezing like i don't know i think it's like 20 to, to 30 motor units at a time i'm like hold on let's take a look how many motor units to move at our eyes <laughs> uh yeah six muscles we know that but how many Yeah, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> we don't need to spend too much time on that. Anyway, it's probably, I think it's like 20 to 50 motor units, uh, 20 to 30, 20 to 50 motor units used for your, you will use thousands of motor units <laughs> when you're squeezing your glutes. It's the biggest muscle in your body, right? Um, so there's just a big difference there. We, 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 you know, I'm not going to the gym to lift a barbell with my eyeballs, you know? <laughs> um, but I'm definitely trying to lift with my glutes as hard as I can, right? Um, so that's a little bit of motor. And then we'll also see another adaptation, which is an increased ability to stabilize muscles, increased stabilization due to what we call proprioception. Your body will develop a better awareness of its body position, what form it's in. This is improved form, basically. And then all of a sudden, you'll also have better balance, you know? Um, so uh, Alexia, I think, is the most relevant example of this, or you're, you're in the closest proximity to the relevance to what I'm about to say. But let me ask you guys a question. And I know some of you guys know the answer is because I ask you this all the time. Uh, do you think walking is harder now that you are an adult? Or do you think it is harder when you are a little kid? You've got a little kid, so I'm assuming... What do you think? You know, I'm sure you've seen him walking along and then, you know, <laughs> it's just out of nowhere. When I was a kid, my parents used to say they would literally watch me stand and I'd just be doing nothing. And I would just very slowly and I would just fall over. My parents said all of them. They were like, I said I was the clumsiest, clumsiest kid they'd ever seen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, Alexia Simon, let me ask you. Do you think it's harder to walk now that you're an adult or harder to walk when you're a kid? A kid. Uh, yeah. a kid. See, here's the thing. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Uh, when you're a kid, you're very uncoordinated, right? And so a lot of falling down. <clears throat> but here's the thing. As an adult, you're way heavier. <laughs> like, like gravity's pulling harder now. So I would argue that it is harder to walk as an adult, but the difference is you're very, very, very good at it now because your body has been overloaded so often, the heavier you got, the more your body adapted, right? The heavier you get, the more your body adapted. And you got better and better and better and better and better at it. So I'd argue that it's actually harder to walk as an adult, but adults are better at walking. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> kind of a weird distinction there but i love that i think that's really motivating you know nothing in this world not to get on like a tony robbins soapbox or anything like that but nothing in this world ever gets easier we just get really really good at it which means we have the ability to kind of get good at anything we want you know um and that's the principle of overload in a nutshell it depends on what you're trying to over how you're trying to overload because it's going to depend on what you want to adapt to you know um, but that's a big part of it. Now, cardiovascular changes are also going to be adaptations, right? Uh, so for instance, your body will increase the number of mitochondria in your cells. There is such a thing as mitochondrial hypertrophy. However, it's not, um, it's not a lot. <laughs> um, in fact, a lot of times we're talking about mitochondrial hypertrophy. They're a little worried about it. Um, sometimes like we don't want to see hypertrophy in your heart. We want your heart to remain the same size. <laughs> uh, cause if your heart gets bigger, it pulls the chambers apart. That's, we don't love that. <laughs> but, um, here's the thing. The more hypertrophy you shove into a muscle cell, there's more stuff in the muscle cells. So the muscle is going to be a little bit bigger. And that's why, yeah, type one muscle fibers are definitely smaller than type two, but it still does result in muscle growth. And that's why in the video, he was saying like, you'll get hypertrophy with a rep range of like six to 25. NASM would have said six to 20. Um, and you'll get mitochondrial hypertrophy from like 12 to 20. 
you'll get like sarcoplasmic, which is like fluid glycolysis hypertrophy from six to 12. And you'll get myofibrillar hypertrophy from like one to five. Uh, we will see those different hypertrophy types uh, and muscle growth. We'll see those tomorrow because we're talking about training the muscular system tomorrow. Um, but it's a good thing to, to bring it up now because like it's very relevant to the principle of overload, right? So all of those are overload changes, right? Your body goes, oh no, I need more mitochondria. So it makes more mitochondria. Oh no, I need more rods running through my muscles. So it makes more myofibrils. Uh, oh no, I need more cellular volume. So it makes your muscle cells bigger, right? All of those are related to progressive overload. Um, any questions so far or comments, comments, questions, concerns, <laughs> everybody feeling good? So when you're doing hypertrophy, how do you say it? Oh, it's the worst. Hypertrophy. <laughs> you can say hypertrophy. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it is supposed it's a hypertrophy. <laughs> hypertrophy. So you can still gain strength through hypertrophy, but that's not essentially the goal. Like strength right. would just naturally. Exactly. So like, you know, honestly, like Arnold Schwarzenegger is kind of a, an example of like, he's a bodybuilder, right? Um, he's not a power lifter, but he is still really strong, like make no mistake about it. Um, you know, and, and, he, and that's also because he's like an old school bodybuilder. We didn't know as much about this stuff back in the day. So a lot of bodybuilders unwittingly also became very strong <laughs> um, in the old school style. Nowadays, a lot of bodybuilders are actually kind of weak <laughs> in comparison um, just because they know how to be like, well, I know how to make my muscles big. Um, and that's all they focus on because that's how you win the competition, you know? I'm sure somewhere out there a bodybuilder is like the neck on their hair just raised up. He's like, somebody's talking trash, you know? <laughs> um, but now you see like there's, you know, but look at a power lifter, right? You look at like, um, uh, we pulled him up, we pulled him up yesterday, but you look at like Eddie Hall, right? He's a big dude, you know? And he looks like he's like chubby, <laughs> uh, which he's really not. I mean, like he's shredded down a lot lately because uh, he's going to go get into that. He was supposed to get into the boxing ring with, uh, with the mountain from Game of Thrones. Um, <clears throat> but like, you know, that's a lot of, we call that myofibrillar hypertrophy, right? Um, that's an example of just like a muscle cell that is absolutely packed full, right? Um, and you can see it's, it's kind of different looking. You can see there's a lot of muscle kind of everywhere versus like, let's look up uh, just kind of your classic uh, bodybuilder here. You know, this guy's probably very strong, but like, see how he's very lean. There's not a lot of like abdominal banding, they call it, uh, where like he's really wide through here versus like, and you can see it just, he's much wider through this. Um, that's because like, he does a lot of like power lifting, which means, you know, he's probably wearing a really heavy weight belt. And a lot of people think weight belts are used to brace your back. That's not what they're for. Like your weight belt is not to help you create stability by squeezing and holding everything in place. That's, that's not what a weight belt is. A weight belt is a, a cue. It's meant to be um, like a cue that you can feel. And your job is to push your muscles into the belt as hard as you can. So you go, Whoo! and you push out with your stomach and you push out with your back. And that creates abdominal pressure, which keeps your spine from, from getting injured. So like very different, right? And look at this guy here. You can see very thin through here, large muscles, right? Um, but I would argue probably not as strong as you would see, oh, there's Lynn Norton, uh, probably not as strong as you would see in like a power lifter. That makes sense? Yes. And still strong, like, you know, again, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to like talk trash and then all of a sudden some bodybuilder bust through my door back here, you know, <laughs> like still strong, but like, um, I mean, it's just a different athlete, you know, I think yeah. I'm fast, you know, but like if I went up against an Olympic sprinter, you know, like I'm ultimate Frisbee fast. I'm not Olympic sprinter fast. Those are very yeah. different athletes. <laughs> so it's more like depending on what you train on, that's what you'll that's what you'll get better at so whatever so eddie hall trains differently compared to like conor mcgregor right so they're two completely different athletes so yeah conor mcgregor he's training to get fast he's training to get strong for a different reason so his yeah. build is going to be differently it's going to be different builds for different things you know yeah. 
Okay. Did any of you guys, we brought it up, um, Simon, Alexia, you guys haven't heard me say this. A lot of, did anybody watch those videos I talked about uh, last year um, with the uh, uh, bodybuilder versus powerlifter versus like a strong man? They do the competition between the four of them. This is a, if you guys get a chance, this is a super fun little series. It's by, uh, this one's on bodybuilding.com. It's by Brute Strength. They're the ones who actually did it. And what it is, is they did like a deadlifting competition. So here's a power lifter. Now this guy is going to lift uh, a lot of freaking weight. This guy, like he's a, a professional power lifter and he's competing against a bodybuilder. He's competing in against an Olympic weightlifter, which is the snatch. That's a clean, the clean and jerk and the snatch, just those two movements. And then he's also competing against a crossfitter. Um, so there's 825 pounds on his deadlift, which is not his record, but it was definitely enough to win this competition for the day, right? We go back, look at the bodybuilder, right? Big guy, big freaking guy, you know? Uh, and then you can see like, he's going to do 545 pounds. That's, that's more than I can deadlift, you know, he's very strong, but he's not 825 pounds strong. Right. Um, so there's, you know, very much large, largest muscles in the room for sure. Cause he's the bodybuilder. Right. Um, but it's just, this is not his event. In fact, I'm not sure he gets this one up. Yeah. He also, I love that guy throughout the whole series. He's like, whenever he's tapped out, he's like, nope. <laughs> it's like not the most competitive out of all of them. So then there's this guy. Here's the CrossFitter. How much does he get? Uh, where's his weight? Oh, I guess they're just kind of going through it. So there's the CrossFitter. Um, strong dude. That's, uh, what was that? That was four plates on both sides. That was at least 415 or 405. Um, let's see where he taps out. Skipping forward slightly. <laughs> Just trying to find, I'm trying to find the CrossFit guy's last weight. 500. So a little bit less than the bodybuilder, actually. Um, and CrossFit does a lot of heavy lifting, right? I think that was a record for him, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then there's also... Uh, this guy here, this is the Olympic weightlifter. So he only uh, does like the clean and jerk and the snatch. Those are his two lifts. Um, and he does pretty well on the deadlift, but like, I think he gets to around the 300 pound mark, 365. Yeah. And look at him. Watch that. Actually, this is so funny. Look at this. Watch how he does his deadlift. He almost goes into, look, at he pulls it. <laughs> he's trying to do a, he's trying to do a clean because <laughs> that's his sport, right? That's what he's really good at. So you can see he does this extra shrug that is not part of the deadlift, but it's like, you know, his muscle memory is taking over in that moment. Um, and it's not doing anything for him. Yeah, like it's not helping him at all. Um, so different athletes, right? Right, like different, different things. Oh, he, oh, that's right. He also clips his hand. I forgot about that. Anyway, so later on, they're all competing, right? They're all competing in each other's events. They do a, a, a physique competition. <laughs> and you can see like very different they learn how to pose and stuff and then like there's another episode where they do a crossfit workout so they do different workouts and they're seeing who is going to get the most points like you know uh for the the various different things um and i won't give the result away but if you guys get a chance watch that video and then there's a there's a ladies episode too there's there's a crossfit uh um bodybuilder uh uh, actually, the bodybuilder is Laura Lynn Bailey, who is like a very famous female bodybuilder. Um, and then there's a uh, um, uh, crossfitter, bodybuilder, Olympic weightlifter, uh, and then a powerlifter. And the powerlifter girl, she is so strong. It's wild. It's so fun to watch. So anyway, watch that. Watch both those episodes. Watch both those videos, guys. Super fun. It will give you a really clear example of like the principle of overload and the principle we're talking about here, which is the principle of specificity. So speaking of being specific, right? A training principle, uh, this principle of specificity states that the body will adapt specifically to whatever stress you place upon it. We will often call this the SAID principle, S-A-I-D. And what that means is that your body has specific 
adaptations to the imposed demands. Are you going to become a better marathoner by sprinting? No, those are different things. Are you going to become a better sprinter by marathoning? No, those are different things. Are you going to learn how to dunk a basketball by shooting uh, uh, shots at the free throw line? No, those are different things, right? Like that's the principle of specificity. You need to get specifically good at a skill, right? So aerobic athletes are going to engage in much more type one cardiorespiratory exercise. Whereas like uh, strength athletes are going to focus more on type two strength training exercises. So here's the other side of the principle of specificity. This is one of the reasons why it is so freaking important to train with proper form. When you do something the wrong way, your brain is learning how to do it the wrong way. <laughs> and that's not good, right? So proper execution of the, of the movement patterns is very important because your body will adapt to that style of training. So there's sort of three sides to this, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this today, but this becomes really important in other classes. Um, there's three sides to being specific. There's the mechanical side of specificity. There's the neuromuscular side of it. And there's the metabolic side of it. And what that means is like the mechanical side is like, okay, when I'm picking an exercise and I'm picking how to do that exercise, how many sets, how many reps, stuff like that, right? Um, mechanically, I'm going to look at my sport and say, okay, I need to be really, really strong for this sport, right? Um, and so I look at it, I'm like, okay, I need strength. So mechanically, I'm going to lift very heavy. And I need strength in my legs, so I'm going to pick leg exercises. So that's the weight that you're choosing and the movements associated, right? So yeah, if you're a runner, you need to <clears throat> strengthen your legs, right? If you're a uh, boxer, you need to strengthen, I mean, honestly, you need to strengthen everything if you're a boxer, but like you need to strengthen your arms, right? And your chest and, you know, you need to get better at punching in particular, right? Serratus anterior and stuff, you know? Um, if you're a calisthenics athlete, you need to strengthen your, your, your lats, you know? So you're going to pick body parts and then specifically whatever weight it is that you're trying to do. Right. Um, now neuromuscular side of being specific, uh, is going to be the exercise selection and the tempo exercise selection refers to, are you picking a machine? Are you picking, uh, an exercise like on a stability ball doing something really wobbly? Or are you picking something that um, you can like throw, be kind of explosive with, right? It's the choice of version. It's like the difference between like a chest press uh, while you're on like a ball, right? So I'm like on a stability ball right now and I'm doing a chest press like this, right? I'm doing all this balancing stuff. It's great for stability, terrible for strength because it has nothing to do with lifting heavy. If I want to lift heavy, I got to be on a bench or in a machine, and I'm just gonna drive that weight up as much as I can. And if I were trying to build power, I'd probably use like a ball or something and throw it as hard as I can. Exercise selection. Cable machines are very wobbly, right? Regular like machines are very stable. Benches with barbells are very stable, right? So you're choosing the exercise selection, and then you're also choosing your tempo because that's gonna have to do neurologically. If I'm trying to get more strong and I'm trying to get more explosive, I need to lift explosively, right? If I'm trying to develop stability, I need to lift kind of slowly to give my brain time to learn the movement. So if I'm wobbling around like this, I'm probably going to go really slow with my tempo. And that way, every time I move over here, my body, my brain has time to go D -d 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 and put me right back in the right spot, right? So the neuromuscular side of things is the exercise selection. Think of that as how stable the exercise is and the tempo, how fast you're lifting. And lastly, the thing that's very relevant for the last 12 days we've, we've well, the last couple of days we've had in class, right? Metabolic specificity. That's the reps and the, the rest period. If I'm trying to build endurance, I need to do a lot of reps. If I'm trying to build strength, I don't need very many reps. If I'm trying to build hypertrophy, I'm somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, if I'm trying to get endurance, I need very low rest. If I'm trying to build strength, I need lots of rest. 
if I'm going for hypertrophy, I'm somewhere in the middle. So um, that is the three sides of things. These are the three things that created the principle of specificity. Now, I said this while we were at Sochi, and I'll say it again because it is really important. Um, you will do, you need to do all of this to write effective programs. You need to make sure that your programs are specific. You can do that though, as long as you follow NASM's rules. <laughs> they will do all of the work for you. <laughs> um, you know, it used to have to be, you'd be like, all right, my client wants to do this, so I should probably do this many reps and this many sets. And you'd have to like consider all the physiology and then like pick it all out, right? NASM has made it really easy for you. Um, there are tables in your textbooks, in your program design chapters, guys, that look like this. And those little tables have numbers. If you're trying to build stabilization, right? Let's say you want to be, you want to be able to, like, you want to learn how to do a one-arm push-up, right? You know, that's the training scene from Rocky. <laughs> He's doing the one-arm push-ups, right? Um, for a little while, I wanted to learn how to do that. And I did, and now I, I can't do it anymore. But I, <laughs> as younger, I wanted to learn how to do it. So I practiced. It was, I wrote a whole, like, chest routine that was strictly built around getting really good at the unstable stuff. So I could do a one-arm push-up. Um, so if you want to be good at stabilization, here's how many reps you need to do, 12 to 20. Here's how many sets you need to do, one to three. Here's your tempo, slow. We call that a four, two, one tempo. So that's four seconds on the way down, a two second pause in the middle, and one second on the way up. Uh, the intensity is low. It's only 50 to 70% of your one rep max. If you can lift 100 pounds, it's like 50 to 70 pounds. And zero to 90 seconds of rest. You follow all those rules, you will be applying physiology perfectly. That's why you guys came to NASM. Like we're all going to apply the rules of physiology to write really effective workouts for our clients. And it's honestly really easy. All the work's been done for you. You just have to memorize those tables. <laughs> so you don't have to like continually flip to those pages over and over and over and over and over again. And that uh, for my two new folks, that is what I will teach you guys at the end of the module. So when we get to the weight loss class, it'll be the last class you guys take before we bring in the next group of students. Um, we always do program design at the end of the mod. Mr. Brad, one question. You also, when you start working at the gym, do you have to do, fill up a forms too? Do what? Do you have to fill up like some forms for like new clients or something like that or no? Yeah, so you'll always start by doing like an assessment, which you'll have like a little assessment form to fill out. Um, and then you want to write them a workout. So you want to write something that kind of looks like this. Uh -huh. um, and then do we, can we do that as a practice or no? Oh, yeah, very much so. No, no. Yeah, you're going to get sick of practicing it. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, no, we it just we do that at the end of the month. Right now we're doing all the science. We'll teach you how to practice that stuff at the at the end of every module. Okay. And then when you get to most class guys, like I usually just give examples for you. I do a lot of the program building. You'll do program building when we meet in person. Uh, we'll start getting into that later, uh, later in the next couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> when you get with Mo though, he's going to be having you do it like every day. Like that's, that's what the capstone is. It's like, you guys know all the science, show me how to apply it, you know? Um, so there is kind of a different, that's why we have two different teachers and two different sections. Um, so next one, I'm going to move past this one pretty quick. There's the principle of individual differences. This is a training principle that states that obviously the training for a sport or activity should be based on the client's goals. Um, the goal here is to capitalize on someone's strengths and help them overcome any of their weaknesses as an athlete. Honestly, that's obviously important, but I think it's covered by the principle of specificity and the principle of overload. You remember those two, obviously every athlete's gonna be different, you know? So I, you know, I, you can move past that one pretty quick. Uh, there's also the principle of reversibility, which is a bummer. Uh, and that is uh, adaptations are reversible if you stop training. Um, so remember I said like, you know, cardio, your cardio enzymes, they only last about a week, two weeks maybe. So when you take like two weeks off from the gym, you'll notice you'll be sucking air when you go back to the gym. You're like, this feels so much harder than it did. Your muscles are just as strong as they were, but the enzymes that are helping you produce energy, 
they're just not around. So your body needs to make new ones. And guess what? It can do that over the course of a, a couple of weeks. It actually doesn't take that long to make new enzymes. Um, so that's kind of cool. It comes, it comes back pretty quick. Uh, but it will feel bad for that first week back. It's always like a, it's a real confidence breaker. Um, so that's the principle of reversibility. It, you know, if you stop training, you're gonna, you, if you don't use it, you lose it, you know? <laughs> um, and that's true of flexibility, strength, power, cardio, all of it. Uh, and then there's the principle of progression again. Again, we call this the, the principle of overload, right? Gradual progressions in your workload uh, will result in improved uh, muscular, but also cardiovascular fitness, right? And so uh, if you want to continue adapting, you need to continue overloading. And that's where like, when you hit a plateau, guys, it's time to change things up. It's time to do something a little bit new. So those are all of our principles. Um, now we're going to kind of move into a different type of principle, which is like all the stuff you need to do when it comes to working out. Uh, you know, we were saying this the other day, Chris was, we were in class and like, it was like, uh, we were talking about how important it is to warm up or no, I think it was Eddie maybe. And so it was just like, oh, I always skip my warmups. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, people love to skip their warmups. If people love to skip their warmups, people really love to skip their cool downs, you know? Um, but trust me, guys, warming up and cooling down has benefits beyond just protecting you from injury. Because I, God, I constantly hear this. I hear it all the time where people are like, I never warm up and I never get hurt. It's not just about getting hurt. It is also about making sure that like, you know, you are having the, your best performance possible. It's like, so I'd say, yeah, you may not have gotten hurt, but I'll bet your performance would have been better if you do it, you know, this way. So, a warm up should always precede any intense exercise, right? Um, and it would, you know, basically you are trying to help prepare the body physiologically and psychologically for exercise. So, if you guys are like me, I, I've got a bit of a bad temper uh, when it comes to being in the car. <laughs> <laughs> a really bad temper when I'm driving. Like I'm constantly just like, mother, you know, like, <laughs> get out of my way. Why would you do that? You know, I just losing my mind when I'm in the car. Um, so <laughs> when I drive to the gym, I get like that sometimes where I'm just like, I walk into the gym and like, I'm parked, I'm in the gym, I'm in my gym clothes. And I'm just like thinking about that, you know, Hummer that, that, that cut me off. Um, so I go on the treadmill, I get on there for five minutes. I run out, you know, maybe half mile or so, you know, just real gently, keep taking it easy. You know what it does? It clears my freaking brain and it prepares me and says, hey, you know what? I know you get deadlines at work. I know that like, you know, girlfriend's birthday's coming up. You know, <laughs> I got all these things. We got a lot of stuff to think about. It's tax season. You know, my brain gets to go, you know what? We will come back to that later. And it flushes it all out and I get focused. And then I'm ready to work out. I'm ready to lift. And that's one of the reasons like it psychologically prepares you for your workout. Now there are sort of two types of workouts out there. I'm sorry, warmups uh, out there, guys. Um, we've got general warmups, which is what we did when we were at Sochi. I did a general warmup with you guys, right? We weren't really specific about anything. We just did some general stretches and some general like body weight calisthenic exercises just to kind of get everything turned, get the right stuff turned on, get the right stuff turned off, just to kind of get you prepped, right? That's a general warmup, right? You go to the gym, you do a little bit of foam rolling, you stretch out, you know, you're just kind of getting prepped, right? Getting on the treadmill for five minutes, that's general, right? Even if, you know, because it doesn't, it's because, the treadmill has nothing to do with squatting, right? Now, specific warmups are warm-up exercises or warm-up routines that are very specific to the sport or very specific uh, to the exercise that you will be performing. So when you do like a warm-up set or a warm-up run, calisthenic exercises that are very, very similar to whatever activity, I would argue like a set of push-ups is a really good warm-up exercise before the bench press but it's a general warm up before like lunges, right? So it's specific to the chest stuff. It's general to, to anything else, right? Um, both are good. I think there's, there's really great ways to kind of apply all of that. But these are some test questions. I've seen these on, on NASA and tests before. They love to ask you, uh, what is the difference between a general warm up and a specific warm up? A specific warm up is related specifically to the activity you're doing that day a general warm up is just going to generally prep the body. 
Um, you know, when we think about like um, hopping on a treadmill for five minutes, you know, that's going to uh, increase tissue temperature, metabolize things and get you ready for exercise. Your body will go, oh, we must be getting physically ready to do a lot of physical activity. You know what? I'm going to shut down the blood flow to the digestive system and I'm going to increase the blood flow to the muscles. Great. Thank you. Warm up. You know, like that's, that's exactly what we want. Cause then you're going to perform better in the gym. And then specific warmups are going to get you turned on. Like um, anybody in here who is thinking about doing heavy strength training, I recommend downloading this app. You want to get stronger, download this app. Uh, it's called warm up lifts. Um, uh, oh, where is it? <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, there's a warm up sets calculator. All right. Well, here's a, it's an app that does your warm up set. So here's warm up reps, right? Uh, let's say I'm trying to max out on a deadlift, right? And last time, uh, like, or the number I'm trying to hit today, uh, let's say it's 415 pounds, right? So for my first set, I should just do the bar for one set of five reps, rack the bar, throw some weight on it, take it up to 165 pounds right? Do that for five more reps. Uh, put some more weight on there, get it up to 245. Do that for five reps. And then as I start to get close to my working rate weight, I'm going to lower the reps down. So I'm going to do 290 pounds for three reps because I'm not trying to exhaust myself before my, before my working sets. So 290 pounds for, for three, uh, 330 pounds for one, 370 pounds for one. And then finally my working set, which is like my first actual work uh, 450 pounds. I'm gonna try and get it up off the ground for one rep. And there you go. That's a warm up. This calculator did all the math for us, right? Um, there's a million versions of those on the app stores and stuff. Uh, mine is called warm up lifts. Um, and it calculates out all my numbers. I use it for my clients. I use it for myself all the time. Um, one of my favorite ways to warm up with like my clients is to say, all right, hop on. And they'll just, let's say they're doing bench press. I'll hit the calculate, start with that first number. I pull them off the bench. I have them go do some like arm circles, you know, scarecrows, all kind of wall angels, all kinds of different stuff. And then as they're doing that, I take them back to the bar and their new weight is on there. So I'm like 10 reps of this. And then I put the weights on, get them ready for the next one. I'll take them through three or four specific warm up sets before uh, I actually move them into it. My clients don't get injured, you know, and they perform really well because. They're getting warmed up, turn the nervous system on. So that's a specific warm up uh, versus a general warm up. Both are very, very good. Uh, and then we got to talk about cool downs here. Uh, so, cool downs are not mentioned in the PowerPoint, but obviously uh, very important. Uh, uh oh. Uh. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, cool downs are obviously very important. This is about returning your body to normal. Now you might not think that your cool down is very important. It's the kind of the thing that everybody loves to skip. Uh, <laughs> but, um, basically you want to stretch out any of the muscles that you worked previously, <clears throat> that's going to help drive a little bit of blood flow there and keep you from tightening those muscles up. We don't want your muscles to become overly tight because you use them too often. Um, hold on just a second, guys. God. Um, Uh, and then also one of the other big benefits is actually, uh, this doesn't seem like a big benefit, but trust me, it is very good. Uh, it provides an emotional balance to the exercise and a gentle transition back to rest. We got to remember exercise is stressful to your body. Your body is going to make, uh, adrenaline, cortisol, all kinds of stress hormones. So when you're trying to get back to normal, you need to recover right after your exercise is over. 
you need to like return it back to home. So you're saying to your body, hey, we're done. We fought the bear. We won. It's over. De-stress. And that's really important to, to, to help like rebalance your body. Uh, and then also when it comes to decreasing soreness, a little bit of cardio after your workouts. I don't mean like you have to do a full cardio session or anything like that, but just five minutes on the treadmill doing a little bit of cardio uh, can help flush out any of the uh, lactic acid that you might be leaving in your muscles. Uh, if you got nauseous during your workout, that can help balance that out uh, and it will help with your soreness. Um, so uh, I know most of you guys have heard me say this, but Simon, a uh, question for you in particular, because I this is a, a trick question kind of, uh, but I always ask, I always ask my new folks. Um, what's the best way to keep from being sore after a workout? Uh, cold shower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a little bit of an off-speed answer. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, that does actually, that actually has been shown to help a little bit. People usually say stretching. Oh, okay. You know, it's funny. Honestly, stretching doesn't really have much of an effect on whether or not you're going to be sore. Oh. It'll provide you with a little bit of temporary relief when you are sore, like you stretch out and then you're like, oh, I feel better for about 30 seconds. And then it just kind of tightens back up. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to keep from feeling super, super sore after your workout is a little bit of cardio. Oh. A little right. bit, a little five minutes on treadmill. Just walk it out, get your heart rate up, flush out that lactic acid. Statistically, that has been shown to decrease soreness. Okay. With, with the, the bike also count? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just say treadmill a lot. Uh, but yeah, bike, Stairmaster, uh, even just like hitting a punching bag a little bit, you know, get your heart rate up at the very end, do, you know, one or two rounds. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good example as well. Sweet. Nice. Jump rope. I, yeah, I could keep going. Uh, <laughs> I'd say like all pop into my head. All right. Um, so uh, we've been talking a little bit about our energy systems, right? So obviously... Uh, we got to take a look at how we transfer from those energy systems. I'm going to do this quickly because you guys are practically experts on this stuff by now. Uh, but I loved, I broke this down a little bit differently here. You can kind of see when it comes to energy trans, whoops, uh, when it comes to energy transfer, uh, it looks a little bit different, right? Like we start with, um, you know, there's, there's a couple different ways to produce ATP. There's four, four ways, right? There's uh, the ATP PC system. That's the first one, right? Uh, there is the glycolysis, uh, there's the Krebs cycle, and there's the electron transport chain. So those are sort of our four energy systems. So we really kind of start with the anaerobic glycolysis because that's the true like energy maker. You know, like the ATP PC system is not making ATP, it's just kind of reattaching ATP. So you can see here, we've only got it listed um, as like, you know, three specific things here. Um, so as we look at it, glycolysis, the ingredient that goes in is glucose and it makes ATP. And then the byproduct is pyruvate. So that pyruvate will ferment into lactic acid. In the Krebs cycle, the ingredient is lactic acid, which we made here as a byproduct, um, plus oxygen. And we'll get a little bit of ATP, that's our product. And our byproduct is gonna be like a little bit of CO2. So we're gonna exhale that. But our other byproduct, which is important is NAD and fat. In the electron transport chain, the ingredients are NAD and fat plus even more oxygen. We get a lot of ATP and our byproducts are a little bit of CO2 and a little bit of water actually uh, that was left over from uh, the hydrogen ions from our atoms from the um, uh, from the carbohydrates and the oxygen from, you know, the oxygen we brought in. So here we broke it down just a little bit different, right? It's like ingredient, product, byproduct. And then this byproduct becomes the ingredient. And then this byproduct becomes the ingredients, right? Uh, and this would be like uh, two molecules of ATP. This would be like two molecules of ATP. And this would be, depending on who you ask, we'll say 36 molecules of ATP. Um, -ish. <laughs> 36 ish. We're, we're not on it. We don't have a flat number for that one. Um, so, anaerobic adaptations are, you know, where your body is going to get better at this section, glycolysis and the, the, the ATPPC system, right? Um, that's where your body is going to sort of, you know, get 
particularly uh, you know, better at that, right? So some of our anaerobic adaptations that we're gonna see um, are going to be like, uh, and when we talk about like anaerobic athletes, right? We're talking about athletes in non-endurance sports. Bodybuilders are a very good example of that, right? I would argue football players are a really good example of an anaerobic athlete. They might be saying it's like, well, football players have to do a lot of running. They're on the field for, you know, a whole game. Um, you know what's funny about football, guys? How long, uh, how much time is actually spent playing football? <laughs> it's about 18 minutes worth of actual football time. <laughs> Every time you watch a game, like all the commercials, all the timeouts, all the breaks, halftime, all that stuff, you know, you're watching a, a three hour game, you know, um, there's only about 18 minutes of action. Now split that in half because half of it's offense and half of it's defense. Right. And now you get about nine. So as a football player, you're going to play about nine minutes, <laughs> right. Over the course of several hours worth of time, I would argue that's a pretty anaerobic athlete. They're really explosive for a, in, a, in a short duration, and then they get lots of rest, and they land right back in anaerobic land. So right as they maybe were about to become aerobic, they're going to fall right back into anaerobic land. Um, bodybuilders, very much anaerobic, right? Um, so the metabolic adaptations for anaerobic training are very reliant on... Uh, um, glycolysis as an energy system, right? We're really going to break down carbohydrates, spit that into glucose, and then build up lactic acid, which if we were to keep going for endurance wise, we would then use that lactic acid. But this kind of athlete, chances are it's like right as they're about to transfer into aerobic, they just get their rest period. And so they kind of just stay in that lactic acid production system, which is what's going to create that type 2A or type 2X muscle fiber types, because all that lactic acid sits there, damages the muscle, and then your body goes, oh, principle of overload, our muscle's damaged, I need to make this more resistant to damage in the future. So it makes it bigger and stronger. So anaerobic adaptations, uh, are going to happen primarily with like strength athletes are our sort of favorite example but guess what it can happen with runners swimmers as well you know uh running and swimming uh you know when it comes to like resistance training you can still experience anaerobic adaptations right this is where um we're going to be looking at our uh we call them work to rest ratios um so if you're trying to get better at glycolysis, honestly, a one to one work to rest ratio is going to work pretty well or higher. Um, you're probably going to want to go like one to three, maybe even one to five. What I mean by one to three is like, or one to five, is I mean that like if you did 30 seconds of work, you're going to take 90 seconds of rest. So let's say you get on a treadmill and you do a one to two work to rest ratio. You do 20 seconds of sprinting and you do 40 seconds of rest. There's a really famous uh, uh, soccer player. Um, oh, God dang it, soccer player. What's it called? John Terry cardio workout. So I've, I've showed this before, but the John Terry treadmill workout. John Terry's a footballer, and uh, here's how this uh, workout works. So you get on a treadmill, and you stick it to a 12% incline. It's 12 on the incline. Uh, and you put it at 11.2 on the speed, and let it get up to speed. You're standing on the edges. And you'll notice what you do, this guy here, you're going to, you're going to, Put your feet on the treadmill and sprint for 20 seconds. So he's on it. Oh, good. <laughs> Get out of here, Grimmerly. Um, so he's sprinting for 20 seconds. And then he jumps off the treadmill. He sits there and recovers for 40 seconds. So you can literally just look at the one, you know, look at the timer on the treadmill. For the first 20, you sprint, hop off. And then when it gets to two, the two minute mark, that's the next minute. 
sprint for the first 20 seconds of, of minute number two. So sprint, recover, sprint, recover. That is a killer cardio routine. And it actually primarily rely, it's very aerobic, you know, cause he's going to be breathing like really crazy, but he's actually very much training anaerobically. 20 seconds is very short, right? That's glycolysis. However, 40 seconds of rest, not enough time to fall back um, really in and fully reset the system. So you really don't get rid of all the lactic acid, which is why I would argue this is still aerobic because of the limited rest periods, only 40 seconds. Um, but look at how much he is training in the glycolysis, right? It's 20 seconds. That's perfectly glycolysis. So, you know, um, what's great about that is that it's going to teach your body how to recover faster. Your body's going to go, wow, I need to adapt to this better. I need to like learn how, I only get 40 seconds to recover whenever I train. I need to recover in faster than 40 seconds. So what is going to happen? Your body's going to get better at dealing with lactic acid. And that's the adaptation he's going for. Probably pretty freaking important for a football player, a uh, soccer player, right? So that's where interval training comes in. When it comes to anaerobic athletes, bodybuilders, uh, athletes in most sports, interval training should comprise the bulk of your metabolic training when it comes to cardio. Now, that's not true for marathoners, right? Marathoners, they need to focus more on aerobic adaptations, okay? So marathoners are going to work much more in the aerobic side of things. They want to get better at producing ATP in the mitochondria, thanks to the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So they need oxygen much more than an anaerobic athlete, okay? So that's where your cardio training for aerobic athletes is going to focus much more on oxygen. And so your adaptations rather than like increased muscle, uh, increased, you know, lactic acid production, instead your adaptations are going to be cardiovascular. Uh, your body is going to increase your stroke volume. So it's going to pump more blood. Every time your heart beats, your heart will beat harder without having to beat more often, which is great. Um, It'll increase, uh, it'll decrease your blood pressure overall. Um, actually, yesterday, fun, fun fact, fun story. So I go in for this uh, 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 COVID thing. Um, so I'm doing this COVID medical experiment right now. Uh, they were looking for people who haven't contracted COVID, uh, who hadn't gotten their booster yet. Um, and so they're testing out a new booster medication. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I'll be a guinea pig, you know? Um, so I had to drive down to Long Beach and I had to test my blood pressure, uh, and make sure that it was normal, um, before, uh, before they're allowed to like draw my blood and do all this stuff. And, uh, my blood pressure was lower than it was supposed to be. It was like, it was like, um, normally blood pressure went like 120 over 80. Mine was like 105 over 60. <laughs> and they were like, or 105 over 59. And it needs to be a minimum of 60 for them to start the, the thing. And they were like, do you want to do a test it again? I was like, yeah, give me one second. I just go, <sighs> and I just like held my breath for a second <laughs> and then had them retest it. And it's like, whoop, my blood pressure, you know, jumped up to the normal number. And then they were allowed to proceed with the test <laughs> but they were like yeah you get really low blood pressure and i was like well i'm a you know i do a lot of cardio and like my resting heart rate was really low and they were like we need that to be a liar so <laughs> um so that was kind of funny uh that happened yesterday um but that's that's you know cardiovascular adaptations your blood pressure is going to drop because it's able to get more work done with less pressure uh your stroke volume is going to increase because it's going to get better at pumping blood throughout the body um and your heart rate's gonna slow down because it doesn't have to beat as often. Uh, and then your body is also gonna make um, pulmonary adaptations in your lungs as well. It'll actually get better. It'll create more enzymes, uh, which will allow the exchange of oxygen molecules into your blood cells more effectively. Uh, your body will make more uh, hemoglobin. So it will actually attract more molecules of oxygen. And then, uh, in your uh, actual muscle cells, your body will have more mitochondria to eat up all that oxygen and spit out energy. Great for long duration cardio. But typically, athletes 
when we talk about like sports, you're probably going to want to be type 2A or type 2X. Type 2X is like the true explosive. That's like the power lifter we were looking at. And the type 2A is more um, a little bit of endurance. So if you guys watch that brute strength thing, I don't want to give the results away, but I would argue that the CrossFit athlete and the bodybuilder are both uh, type 2A athletes. And I would argue that the power lifter and the Olympic weightlifter are both type 2X athletes. So you'll watch the video and see which one does the best overall. And you'll notice like bodybuilder actually does pretty well in some of the endurance events. He does okay. Um, power lifter, not so great in the endurance events. <laughs> Olympic weightlifter, not so great in the endurance. But the CrossFit athlete pretty much kills it in every endurance category. Um, because he's pretty strong, he's not super strong, but he's pretty strong, and he's got a good amount of endurance, not as much as like maybe a runner, but still a very, very good amount. That's a type 2A athlete. LeBron James, really good example, very strong, you know, every NBA player, by the way, is a good example, um, but very strong, but also a good amount of endurance. So athletes are going to train primarily for those two. Type 2X uh, fibers, by the way, those are good explosive ones, they're going to benefit from things like plyometrics, um, they're going to benefit from really heavy lifting. So, uh, David, you were talking about like, uh, Conor McGregor, right? If you want to get better at like punching harder, uh, you need to, to be explosive here. So probably things like clap pushups, medicine ball throws, uh, but pair that with super heavy lifting that is relatively explosive. Maybe a bench press that looks like this, you know, driving it up as fast as you can, no pauses, right? Pausing doesn't do anything for, you know, uh, uh, an explosive athlete, you know, in fact, it kind of hinders things. Um, factors that are going to affect that, you got to be able to deal with the discomfort of anaerobic training. Here's what sucks about anaerobic training, guys. Um, it freaking burns, you know, <laughs> like you're producing all that lactic acid, you know, and so it builds up. Um, and that's where like, you got to be able to deal with that. Athletes, that's a really big deal. You know, you get two athletes on the field, um, this is one of the reasons why when you're watching football, you see like a really aggressive drive by like a team's offense and like the defense is just exhausted because they're working as hard as they can every play. And when you see those teams that have like a really effective, like hurry up offense, that other, that defense is just sucking air. And if they get a turnover, you know, really quick, this is where like, I get so mad at my Seahawks all the time when I'm watching football. It's like, you know, offensively, the offense will turn it over and the defense has to go back on the field. It's like, offense, you are screwing over our defense right now. Like, they're exhausted. Like, I get so mad while I'm watching football. I'm like, you are making their lives harder. Just hold on to the freaking ball. <laughs> I get so upset. Uh, <laughs> but that's, you know, I, it's, I, it's number one, that probably means you're going to lose the game. But also, like, it's upsetting to see your guys just – you have to deal with it. You know, like, they're so fatigued. It's like, give them a break, would you? Um, defense is hard, you know? So um, athletes are definitely going to want to primarily focus on anaerobic training, but that's going to help them deal with that lactic acid buildup. So our factors that are going to affect both aerobic and anaerobic training are things like intensity. You know, that's the, the, the level of demand compared with maximal effort. Remember, there's a difference between intense and hard. I'd argue the marathon is hard, but it's not intense at all. Um, whereas like sprinting, I would actually say is easier than a marathon, at least easier on the body overall, uh, but is much more intense um, because it's a percentage of maximum effort. You're giving your full max effort in 10 seconds. Whereas a marathon, you're giving a little bit of effort over two and a half hours, you know? Um, so the intensity is one of the things we want to consider. The duration is another one. Obviously, we just said like, 10 seconds versus two and a half hours. Frequency is a big one. You know, uh, you don't want to do high intensity and, and high frequency. That's a, it's a, that's a recipe for injury. You know, if you're working as hard as you can every single day with no rest, you're going to definitely pull a muscle. It's, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster, you know? Um, so we have rest periods, right? This is one of the reasons why we have like training cycles. I love to do like upper body on uh, Mondays. That's like usually chest, back and shoulders. I love to do like lower body on Tuesdays. Uh, that's like mostly like legs. I'll do a little bit of core work in there. Uh, love to do cardio on Wednesdays. Uh, and then I reset the cycle. Upper body again on Thursdays, 
lower body again on Fridays, cardio again on Saturdays. And then I don't work out on Sundays. You know, I'll go hike, you know, do something gentle, but like it's an off day for me, you know? Um, so uh, continuous training when it comes down to it, um, you know, uh, continually like training for aerobic and anaerobic adaptations is going to be helpful. This is one of the things where we come down and we look at uh, interval training, right? And we look at like what our interval rest periods are. This is what I like to call your work to rest ratio. We talked about it a minute ago. Uh, this is where you're going to have like a couple different versions. So if you're training for your immediate energy system, that's like ATP PC system, right? You want to have bare minimum a one to three work to rest ratio. So uh, if I put you on, uh, let's say I take you out to the field and we do like a, 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 a box drill, right? So a box drill is four cones, sprint, side shuffle, back pedal, side, uh, karaoke, uh, and then you're done, right? One, two, three, four. And it took you 10 seconds. Nah, it's going to take longer than that. Let's say it took you uh, 30. That's a lot. Let's say it took you 20 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds to do the whole thing. Well, then I'm going to give you three times the amount of rest to recover. So the best for the immediate energy systems is like a one to three or a one to five work to rest ratio. So I would either give you 60 uh, up to uh, nine, uh, 60 to uh, 100 seconds of rest if it took you 20 seconds to do. And that's one of the reasons why you want to time your athletes, you know? Uh, if you're trying to get better at glycolysis, a one to two work to rest ratio works. Um, so just like we saw in the video, um, he was doing 20 seconds of sprint and then double that in rest. So he's doing 40 seconds of rest. That is a terrific work to rest ratio, by the way, if you're trying to get better at glycolysis. Bodybuilders, when they do cardio, do a one to two work to rest ratio. It's great. You only have to do 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, heck, actually, sorry, take it, you can do 15 minutes. That's great. You know, but that's the type of cardio that is going to give you the adaptations you want to be better at that. And then if you're going to do interval training as like a marathoner, uh, Joseph, if you're trying to get better at half marathoning, right? Uh, aerobic stuff, a one to one or one to one and a half uh, work to rest ratio. So maybe you do like a 60 second sprint, 60 second jog, 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off. And your durations can get a lot longer. You know, I was talking about like 20 seconds or 10 seconds earlier. Um, your durations can get a lot longer when you're in the aerobic system because your intensity is going to drop. But that's a really great one, right? Sprint, you know, when you're out there, um, one of the best ways, like honestly, a great half marathon routine, guys, go to a park that has a really long uphill stretch run up it for one minute, turn around, walk or jog back down for one minute, turn around, run up it for one minute. You'll make a little bit of progress kind of like this until you get to the top of the hill. Terrific way to train for a marathon. Um, so uh, athletes for aerobic adaptations are going to primarily focus on type one. That's going to benefit from long duration exercise and like a one to one ratio. Uh, obviously there's going to be some other things that factors here. I've been talking all day about adapting and, and how we do that. Uh, your genetics are going to play a role there, you know, just, just so we're clear. Um, obviously, you know, genetics are going to have an effect on your strength and your muscle size, uh, your muscle fiber composition. So like, you know, um, what type of your predisposed, I'm very clearly predisposed to more type one muscle fibers, you know, uh, your lung capacity is going to be a big one. Like, you know, some people have bigger lungs than others. <laughs> um, uh, it's one of the reasons Lance Armstrong, I mean, he also was on like a lot of drugs and stuff that helped him. Um, but like Lance Armstrong, one of the reasons he was so effective at cycling, his heart was just a little bit bigger than the average person's. And so were all of his blood vessels. He was exceptionally good. He was genetically predestined to be very good at cardio. Um, and you'll see that a lot in a lot of cardio athletes, actually. Um, aging is going to have an effect. Uh, aging process, usually we actually lose a lot of skeletal muscle mass. We tend to switch from being a type two muscle to type one. So a lot of times we get a lot leaner as we get older. Um, it's a lot easier to gain fat mass. And it's also you know, pretty easy for us to become more sedentary as we get older, which we don't want to do, by the way. We want to make sure we're trying to maintain our energy. 
Um, but that being said, older adults can absolutely still develop muscular strength and cardio adaptation. They can adapt just like anybody else, just not quite as quickly. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different ways to prescribe intensity out there. Uh, there's the VO2 max method. Um, so you know what your VO2 max is, and then you work at a percentage of that. In order to do that, you guys need to go get a very fancy VO2 max uh, test if you're going to get you know very specific about your cardio. And what will happen, um, uh, you'll get a little printout that looks something kind of like this a lot of times. Um, and you'll be like, all right, if I'm trying to be at, you know, uh, the aerobic section, which is here's my aerobic threshold. This is where I'm officially getting better at cardio. Uh, my heart rate needs to be about 160. And if I want to get up to a higher percentage of my VO2 max, I take it up to 190. And so you work somewhere in between there. Uh, and you can see here, this will break down what your VO2 max is and tell you, you know, what numbers to specifically get into. It's good. It's highly accurate. If you're a professional athlete and you've got access to this, go for it. Generally, for most of our clients, uh, we are going to prescribe exercise intensity on a percentage of their heart rate max. So let's say, uh, uh, you know, um, Joseph is, is working on his half marathon training, right? And I know his resting heart rate is, let's say, 65 beats per minute. Uh, Joseph, how old are you? 49. 49. So we'd say 220 minus 49. Uh, um, uh, that's his heart rate max. So I could work him in a specific percentage here and just say 65% or 75%, right? But instead, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to minus his resting heart rate. Uh, let's just say, actually, do you know your, do you know your resting heart rate, Joseph? I do not. We'll say it's very good. We'll say 60 beats per minute. So we'll say minus 60 times 0.65 plus 60. And then I'll get him another one and do that. Uh, so I would say, all right, Joseph, you're trying to get better at the half marathon. I want you to be somewhere between 65 and 75% of your heart rate max. That's going to be anywhere from 132 to 143. And that's how I calculated out his numbers. I needed his age. I needed his resting heart rate. And that's it. It's very easy. You know, um, we'll go over that more at the end of the module. I'll teach you how to do that math. Um, or if you guys have, if you guys want to know your numbers, uh, you can also just go to uh, Carvening Calculator. Google that. Click the first one, uh, and then enter your age, enter your resting heart rate, hit calculate. Scroll down here. And we want to be between 65 and 75% for endurance. We want to be between 75 and 85 for glycolysis. We want to be between 85 and 95 for ATP, PC system. So very different numbers. So there's how I can set up his interval training without just saying, I want you to go hard for a minute and I want you to go easy for a minute, right? And that is called the Carvenin method um, or the heart rate reserve method, depending on who you ask. Um, and that's that, guys. How y'all feeling? Great. Cool. Feeling pretty good. Just a lot of, um, like you said, principles, you know, just a lot of stuff that, a lot of intricacies, you know, if you want to, for different people, you know, different things for different goals. Exactly. It's kind of like a mantra. It's like, it's almost like a series of mantras. It's like, remember these things as you go forth into the world, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, guys. And like I said, you will apply all of these principles perfectly as long as you guys follow NASM's OPT rules. Um, and that's my job is to teach you that. So uh, we'll get there in the next couple of weeks. Um, all righty. So, fellas, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's call and uh, I will see you tomorrow. Sounds good. All right, later, Thank you. Later.